Sean and Toby, that's like, it should be, it should be. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
the time we threw back in the lake, lit up the whole town of Houston to sink it to a piece of music and it was in on the great everybody's car road.
Jesse will get his shit together and take the cash. Old folks say this story happened a long time ago, like 20,000 years ago, or 2 million years ago, or it could be on the verge of coming true at any moment now. Right here, just beneath you, under the dust, once stood the home of the gods. It was called the Village of the Sun. But if you remember, the sun was married to Grandmother Moon, so we all know who actually ran the place. The moon gave birth to one baby, a baby girl, who grew and grew and grew until she became the tallest teenager anyone had ever seen. And her beauty, the world flowered wherever she passed. Everyone would scramble to get a glimpse of the shimmering girl as she floated by. Of course, no boy was good enough for this daughter of the sun and the moon. Where would she ever find a match? She's too tall. And too beautiful. Besides, she is a goddess. So, unlike other teenagers, she dedicated herself to her parents' well-being. Her only joy was keeping the sun and the moon in the sky. The tall girl was always busy. Her mornings were spent splitting wood to start the universal fire from the embers of last night's stars. The sun was a working man. In fact, you could say that without his daily routine, all time would cease and life would become impossible. The alligators of oblivion are always gnawing at the corners of the universe. To the sun, the day is a mountain, where one slope is called morning and the opposite slope, afternoon. When he reached the summit of the peak, he would sit beneath the chocolate bean tree and wait for the moon to bring him lunch. When he came home in the evening, the moon and the tall girl would be ready, waiting with food and great tubs of fresh water. When her parents left the house every day, tall girl took great joy in weaving long strips of beautiful cloth. And by the time she was 17, she had become such an expert weaver that whatever she wove into the cloth actually came alive. Butterflies flew inside the cloth. Jaguars ate fish and rolled on their backs and snored, as if the entire world around us was the imagination of the daughter of the sun and moon. She longed for her own sweetheart and used work to forget her own sadness. Nobody knows how it happened or where it happened, but it happened that the daughter of the sun somehow fell in love. Every day in the late morning, after the moon had padded up the hill to see her husband in the sky, a young and shiny short boy with beautiful little ears came boldly to visit the tall girl. Though he only came up to her knees, her sweetheart was as courteous as she was magnificent. Short Boy would whistle a song, and she would come out into the open and sit herself on the earth so they were at eye level. They never touched each other. They made a language of love together. 
the same type of language used by prayer makers and shamans and other keepers of the majestic and holy. For hours and hours, they would lose themselves in each other's eyes. When I saw you, I thought a million red-breasted bluebirds were rising from a canyon. When I heard your whistling, I jumped and played like a young otter splashing in the liquid jade of your heart. Every afternoon, with tears in their eyes, they would part for fear of the moon finding him. And it was on such a day that fierce old lady moon showed up mid-morning unexpectedly to find her unthinkably disobedient daughter gazing into the eyes of a too short to call boy. What? What? The short boy disappeared like the thoughts of the wind. The tall girl shook and sobbed in shock and grief, bellowing like 200,000 jaguars. Moon shrieked. What? Who do you think you are making love to? That rat sized cowardly zero? But mother, he's beautiful. Beautiful. You're a hussy, a pig's heart, a nothing. Mother, we did nothing. We didn't even touch. We just spoke. Nothing Your speech more. is nothing to you. Our speech makes winds rise, or trees wither and burn. Our very actions, breaths, and thoughts make or break. The world! The sun was overworked, tired, and very hungry. But Moon forced him to listen to the entire story. Sun confronted his daughter. Let him go. You are made for tall things, grand beings, things not small and hidden. If you love him, push him away, otherwise he will be destroyed. To enforce his will, the sun and moon did what no one had done before. They blocked up the doorway. They shut her away from her sweetheart and made her weave larger and larger spans of cloth on her backstrapped loom. Into the cloth, the girl wove the loss of the short boy, the loss of her parents' love, the loss of freedom, the loss of feeling useful. The beautiful girl wept so much that every stone and tree, all the animals and gods pitied her. The rain of her eyes soaked the weaving and caused invisibility to be woven into it, a beautiful cape that would make the wearer disappear. The son's family was a hard, powerful lot, sympathetic to the girl and unwilling to interfere, all except one. Known as Keek, Lord of the North Wind, Lord of the Dry Times, he had no children, no wife, nothing loved him or understood him, and nor did anything want to. When Keek blew, the world dried up and drove everything into old age. He was a law unto himself, and one day, disguised as a small northern wind, he penetrated the sun's hut and discovered the secrets of the cloths of invisibility. But he kept the secret to himself. One morning, after the moon had blocked up the threshold, a small bird could be seen flying in and out of the thatched roof. The little bird kept bumping and thumping, making a constant commotion that the girl could not ignore. The tall girl pushed her face up against the stalks of the thatch, searching and staring until the little whirling creature hovered in front of her beautiful eye. She'd never seen such a strange, shining, miniature bird. Tall girl began to bore a little peephole until the little bird could squeeze through. When the hummingbird entered, he flew right to the tall girl and landed on her left thumb. She held the hurt little bird up to her face and began to tell him her troubles. He said, Yes, it has been dangerous and difficult, but at least we have each other, do we not? The tall girl recognized the voice of her sweetheart. She wrapped him gently in her fine copper hands. Then, eyeball to eyeball, they began speaking where they had left off. When I saw you, I thought the Milky Way had dropped from the sky into your eyes. In the endless dawn, before the sun, I saw your footprints glowing in the dark, leading me home. 
And that's what they did all morning, noon, and afternoon. The big girl with the eyes like pools, gazing into the deep, tiny eyes of the flashing little bird that talked. She didn't care what he looked like, only that he hadn't gone away. One day, Grandmother Moon snuck up without the usual thudding and thumping and burst in fast. In a swift motion, Tall Girl wrapped her fingers around her little bird man and shoved the little fellow deep down into the ample folds of her blouse. The bird zoomed around over her luxurious breasts, around her ribcage, tickling her with his wings, which caused her to laugh and grab at herself. Are you ill, child? The little bird twitched and buzzed in her belly button. <laughs> Do you have cramps? The hummingbird got loose inside the blouse again. Quit that, my love. <laughs> she rolled on the floor in uncontrollable laughter, trying to hold the little bird next to her belly. Why are you holding onto your belly? I've been so lonely, mother. I decided to converse with my belly button. Oh, my <laughs> poor daughter. Are you utterly deranged? Tall girl continued mumbling to her stomach, and so she stayed until her father, the sun, came home. The sun was too hot to care that they might have pushed their daughter too far and only wanted food and sleep. When the world was deep in sleep, the hummingbird began to speak. Tomorrow we had better run away to my village. I think we must live a while in my mother's house. Where is your mother's house? My mother is Ocean Woman, whose realm is even greater and older than your father's. If we flee together and wet our feet in the ocean, my mother will protect us. The girl agreed. The hummingbird became a man again, a short, shiny man with beautiful ears that would listen. The girl unrolled the two invisibility capes, and suddenly, a great shining world shone where once stood the two lovers. All anyone could see was the devastating beauty of the natural world. Thus hidden, they trotted off towards the distant ocean, up hills, down the zigzag trails of ravines, over fallen trees, dense forests, and riverbeds. When the moon returned to their hut and discovered her daughter missing, she dashed madly around the village, shouting, Where is she gone? Where is she? Has she been kidnapped? Is she dead? Then she ran to the mountain of the sky to tell the sun. The sun called out his twelve brothers of the lightning, including the hateful Keek. I can't leave the sky, Lord Robinson. Scour the earth for my beautiful girl. Bring her back to me. The Brothers of Lightning unfurled their flying capes, but Keek, knowing the secret of the girl's weaving, blew his cold, unhappy wind. His terrible breath lifted the capes and exposed the couple to the whole world. Hey, look! Your beautiful daughter isn't lost. She's fallen in love with the son of the ocean and is running away to live there in the palace of the hurricane. What are you saying? You mean that this lowlife is the son of hurricane? If he gets just one hair in there, we'll never get her back. As the gods spoke, the lovers were within feet of the ocean, which was calling to them with a gentle voice. Get them! Stop them! And just as the boy and girl were an inch from the ocean, there was a thick, nauseating cloud on a phosphorescent glow over the beach. Then silence. A long silence. Hummingbird boy had been tossed unconscious, down on the sand like a leaf. When he woke, the world was in tears. His mother was weeping. The trees were weeping. The animals were weeping. Tall girl? Where are you, my beloved? When he found her, she was in pieces. One of her hands was over there, a foot on the other side. Her heart had been blown out of her chest and was far down the beach. 
It was Keek who had deliberately blown her to pieces. He wanted the ocean to hate the sky, to start a war that would end it all. Cradling her smooth heart, Short Boy fell to his knees, sobbing all the tears of the world. The world was plunged into a sea of dying plants and dust. For when the daughter of the sun was dismembered, she left the world without its flowering and its moisture. They say that Hummingbird Boy's grief lasted 3,000 years. The boy who had loved the girl died as well, and a new man grew out of that endless grief. He remembered an ancient song, an ocean thought, a ritual to bring things back together. Without telling anyone, he began to gather all the pieces of his beautiful friend and wrapped each piece in a particular leaf and placed them in a great bag made of stars. Then he hoisted the bag onto his back and made his way to the village of the sun. When he arrived, the whole world was waiting for him. Sun and moon hung their heads in shame and horror unable to look the boy in the face. I have brought your daughter back, the one you killed because you only wanted tall sons-in-law from the sky. You wouldn't let her love the small things of the world and make the world flower. This is your work. Please forgive, Please forgive us. us. We were wrong. We, were wrong. we are, we are so, so sorry. We... Lord. Don't you have the magic to bring my daughter back to life? Please try. There is one chance. There is one thing that might work. What is it, son? What do you need from me? Well, first, I would have to be the boss. I agree. And then you would have to promise to accept her, however she appears. Of course. I promise to accept her as she will be. And if she comes back to life, and if she agrees, you will allow her to marry me. I agree to everything. Bring me a large, open-mouthed cooking pot. <laughs> this was brought to the boy. Now bring me the leaves of the following plants. The peach tree, the wild red banana, the kush, the oj, the shah, the kisses, the tsetzel, and the kinu. Every time he called for the leaves, the villagers eagerly sought them and brought them back. As the leaves arrived, Hummingbird Boy sang old secret songs and prayers as he wrapped each part of the girl's body in a different plant. Then he placed each package inside the pot. First he put her feet, then her calves, her thighs, her trunk and ribs and back and spine, and her arms her beautiful hands, and then her head. He covered them all with a layer of corn leaves. He put the heart in last, which he wrapped with a little bit of all the leaves and a tuft of his own hair, and bound it all with 13 strands of moon's long white hair. Then the boy began a tearful oration that lasted all the day and night. Moon, this pot is now an egg. Your child has become its yolk, and you are the mother bird. When the sun sets, you must sit on the nest all night without sleeping, and under no condition shall you open the pot until the sunrise of the thirteenth day. Do you understand? He repeated these orders three times. Every morning I will return to sing and pray. In the night, I will be in the mountains doing the work of a shaman. And with that, he disappeared. Moon climbed up on top of the pot and sat there all night, imagining her beloved child returning to her. In the morning, when her husband left, Moon heard a scratching sound from inside the pot, like squirrels rustling. The sound happened again, and the poor moon reached to lift the lid of the pot. Stop! I told you, 13 days. Moon made a dedicated vigil for another night, 
But the following dawn, the pot was making sounds again. It pinged and groaned as if it would boil over. Just as the moon was about to lift the lid, Hummingbird skidded in through the door just in time. Don't you understand? If you had removed the lid, your daughter would have been a pot of angry bees. Don't do that again. On the third dawn, the pot began to hiss and rasp, and again, Moon climbed down to lift the lid, and again, Hummingbird arrived just in the nick of time. And so it went on every morning. Moon's grief and curiosity overwhelmed her good sense, and Hummingbird always came just in time. On the fourth dawn, there was a sound of bony armor rattling the air. On the fifth, scuttling, snipping sounds like scorpions. On the sixth, a great water splashing rock the vessel. On the seventh, a squealing like a rabbit pinned by an ocelot. On the eighth, the gnashing of strong jaws. On the ninth, a disappointing sound, a squeak, and then the wind. The tenth dawn sounded like ten billion bark boars chewing down a forest. Eleventh, a plaintive humming. And in each case, the moon nearly ruined it all. On the twelfth day, the wobbly moon could stand it no more. Beneath the lid of the pot rose a human voice, breathing and cooing, and it sounded like her teenage daughters. The moon lifted the lid clear off. The boy blew into the hut a millisecond too late. Nothing came from the pot but the beautiful moaning. Listen, it's her. I know her voice. It's her. How do we get her out of the pot? The boy began to chant. What nice are you? I thought the moon had drunk too much and fallen out of the sky. But I was mistaken. As he spoke, a little soft, ruby-colored horn covered in iridescent feathers emerged from the pot. Then, the big, curly-feathered head of a gorgeous, shimmering blackbird with yellow legs and a long, wide black tail. This never-before-seen bird strutted out of the pot and cried the same ecstatic cry we hear in the mountains in the late spring when the rains return after the long, dry season. The cry of the shy Siak Tanun. This is the daughter that your impatience has made. The moon stared at the huge bird in shock. But to me, she is as beautiful as ever, and I take her for my wife. And for the last time, he turned himself into a hummingbird and hovered at eye level with the new bird, and they gazed into each other's wild, round eyes. These two never-before-seen birds loved each other, one tall, black, and ecstatic, the other short, green, and magical. They went to live in the wild mountains that separate the ocean from the village of the sun and moon. They live there now, and because of them, the world came back alive. Man, there's like nothing here.